Welcome to the Get Fluttered series, where we create modular reusable samples for your Flutter projects. Many of these samples will make use of the Git package, purely because it's easy to use and eliminates a lot of boilerplate. But really, use any package you want. If any of you are interested in building Flutter apps for healthcare, join us on Slack and we can chat. Today we'll focus on data architecture, which has many flavors. We'll be using Git to manage state, but if you want to see some of the other options available to you, check the excellent blog post by Ryan Edge. No single architecture or dependency injection method is best. No matter what you hear, there is no perfect setup. Consider each one carefully and use the method that feels best to you. As you decide, ask yourself, do your classes follow the single responsibility principle? Are they testable? Are they modular? How difficult is this setup? Are others able to understand and build from it? With that out of the way, here's how my clinical mind tends to approach data architecture. I like the model view controller or MVC approach for its simplicity. It's been around since the 1970s, but with decades past, the definitions of M, of V, and of C have all become a bit fuzzy. You'll also see the addition of S for services. G. Skinner has an excellent blog post on MVCS architecture. They define each part well and provide quality beginner and production level examples. The G. Skinner approach to MVCS adds one final concept, which is called a command. Commands can be accessed anywhere and provide a single high level function, such as logging in or logging out. Note that G. Skinner's examples make heavy use of provider, of change notifier, and of stateful widgets, which we're trying to avoid. To simplify this, which I'm calling git mvcs, I needed to make a few changes. The biggest difference is that I'm using the controller to manage state, not the model. In git, state is managed by git x controller. I have a lot of trouble justifying code that says class model extends controller, so I just gave controller charge of state to avoid confusion. Model, by contrast, holds all of the CRUD operations or the event operations that you'd see in a block, and it serves as the single point of failure between your data and the controllers and services that access them. We'll start with the minimum necessary code for a Flutter app. We'll add a scaffold and some text that's centered and large enough to read. We'll add an app bar. In pubspec at YAML, we'll import the git package. We'll let pub git run and retrieve the relevant packages. Update material app with git material app and hot restart the app. With that out of the way, we can now use a controller to manage state. This is done by creating a class that extends git x controller. Create an int called counter with an initial value of zero. Note that if you want counter to be reactive, which we do, simply change int to rxint and add a dot obs to the end of the first value. Now it functions as a stream that widgets can subscribe to for updates. Note that we'll be intentionally swapping between the two options during this video, so you can use either method with or without streams. Now create a gitx builder that uses the controller to listen to the stream. I'm using the quick fix function in VS Code, which has the gitx snippets extension installed so that I can make this a lot easier. The initialize variable only needs to be called once, ideally at the highest point in the widget tree where you need this controller. Note that if you're using int instead of rxint, you'll see errors like you see on the side. This is because git x is optimized to work with streams and git builder is optimized to work with the rest. When git x is past a stream, the error goes away. You'll want to be comfortable swapping between the two because streams are wonderful, but you don't necessarily need them in every part of your application but you'll see this covered at length throughout the videos. Finally, we'll wrap this text widget with a column that has its main axis centered, and we'll add buttons that allow us to count up and to count down. And just like that, we've created the Hello World counter in less than 50 lines of code. Now let's set the ante to make things a bit more interesting. We'll add a row. We'll use the quick fix function on this column to turn it into its own stateless widget. 
and we'll name that counting column. Then we'll replicate that a few times within our row. If you want to call a controller inside multiple widgets, you can use the builder method like we did with git x or git builder, or you can use git.find. Just remember that git.find does not initialize your controller. And you'll want to create a static method within your controller so that Git knows which instance to access. I'll cover this more in my video on data binding. So now we have three counters, but they all connect to the same data. We'll remedy this by turning Rx counter into a list of Rx ints. And create new methods to handle counting up or down. Use the spread operator in our row to map each rxint variable into its own counting column widget. Using the spread operator on the left and the dot map iterable on the right, you're able to take each item within the list and pass forward a counting column stateless widget. Then we pass the rxint variable into the counting column widget. We'll make this a required named parameter that will accept each mapped item from our list. Finally, we'll let the controller handle the count up and count down for each item. This will later be extracted into its own separate command. Note that these methods were created in our getx controller earlier in the video. If we change controller.rxcounter to item, it'll know which item from the list to call. As was mentioned earlier, getx and obx require a stream to work properly. We want these widgets to redraw whenever the stream changes. We'll wrap this column with an obx so it can pay attention to the value. Then we'll go up to the top of the widget tree, which is where the error message lies. We need to swap get x with get builder since no streams are directly called here. In essence, get builder is the first thing to call counter controller, and each counting column stateless widget will use its own stream. Now that each column has its own rx counter, let's do some more optimizations to the code. For simplicity, I'm going to show this without streams, but we'll implement them again at the end of the video. We'll start by turning each counter into its own data class and create a model that handles a list of data classes. Our class accepts an optional parameter, but defaults to zero so that it's never null. We'll extract the countUp and countDown methods into their own command, and we'll create an abstraction to find our counter controller so that we limit boilerplate in these commands. Finally, we'll call controller.update to trigger a redraw of the UI, just in the same way we would with set state in a stateful widget. Now we can move all the duplicates from the controller, whose primary role is to hold state of the model. Moving up the widget tree, we'll have the controller call the model, and instead of passing an rx int item, we'll pass the counter data class. We'll also change item.value to item.counter because we're using a data class instead of a string. And we'll remove all the controller calls from the counting column widget. This way, only the command is dependent on the controller. Now we no longer need the controller variable within this stateless widget. And we can also completely get rid of obx. And like that, our Hello World app now follows the MVCS architecture. If you check the commit history in GitHub, you'll be able to see all these changes in one place. If we want to implement this with streams, we'll add .obs and .value back into the code. Since it now works with streams, we no longer need to call controller.update in our commands. We'll change how the counter class is instantiated and we'll re-implement obx within this stateless widget and hot restart the app. That's it. You now have a reproducible code base that follows the single responsibility principle. It's good practice to use private or final values whenever possible. This helps give the model more control over the shape of our data. Finally, we'll separate all the various classes into their own folder structure. 
I strongly recommend doing this at the beginning so that you don't have to import every single library manually. I only showed it like this so that you could see all the code in one place. If you check the readme of our GitHub page, you'll see a list of every possible folder and the way that we organized it hierarchically. But a lot of this really comes down to personal preference and just making sure that you keep yourself organized. Again, doing this once as you're writing the code makes a lot more sense than trying to do it after the fact. That's it for this video. Let me know in the comments what you want me to cover next. And more than anything, stay safe out there. Thank you.